Hey, it's Louise Havala and you're watching another episode of Gatehouse Insights. And today I'm joined by Cot Manoa, who is a personal injury lawyer at Slater and Gordon Lawyers. Cot, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you, Louisa, for inviting me. Your journey to Melbourne began when you and your family fled the, the Sudanese Civil War, a journey that began when you were four years old. Can you share more of this story and your experience? Uh, my journey in 1986, and that is the best memory I have, uh, I was born in a town called Yirul in South Sudan. So it was attack, so it came under attack, and all I remember is that there was significant bullet fire and what I would call moonlight bomb. It would lit the sky, and when the sky is just like a day daylight, you see people falling and being gunned down. So there was significant uh, number of crossfire. I remember we were being told as kids not to run, but just hug the air and you know, lay down because the sharp nose of bullet were just flying and you could get hit when the sky get dark and the bomb is not letting it, we would then obviously either crawl or get up and move and run. And uh, I obviously eventually with a number of other people went into the forest and bushes, trek for quite some time and reached some outskirts villages where we fought up for some days and eventually made our way deep into the inner part of South Sudan trying to flee the, the town which was overtaken by the government army forces at that time so that is what I remember. You got to Australia, what year did you did you land in, in Australia? I came to Australia after a very long journey so from South Sudan we were internally displaced for quite some time and then eventually went to Ethiopia in 1989. In Ethiopia uh, we were there for a year and a bit and the government was overthrown by uh, the rebel government which was the rebel forces that took over the government and that was in 19, uh, 1991. And then we made our way trekking, coming to South Sudan. It was a significant walk and a bit of a long distance. It lasted several months. And then we eventually crossed into South Sudan and made our way into a number of towns. One of it was Pachala after crossing River Gilo, and then came to Kapoita after crossing Sahara Desert and then leave in Kafota for some time and then came to Nairobi, which is another border town between uh, Kenya and South Sudan and then from Nairobi we went to another town called Key Base. It is the border that is within a walking distance and at all times we were just playing uh, gunfire and, and then came into Kenya and then from Kenya in October or August 1992 we were moved to Kakuma refugee camp which was just like an open desert. Lived there for 12 years and eventually it gained momentum that was in construction building build and came in Australia came to Australia on the 8th of April 2004. Why Australia? Uh, very good question. Australia had a very very good reputation back then. I remember my mum wouldn't even consider applying for United States. At that time there were a lot of visas that were you know quite easy to to get and get to USA but because of the reputation of the gun laws and people being killed and gunned down in towns like New York and some other uh, cities or states in the USA it doesn't it, it did not gain that reputation among the refugee population but Australia obviously is, is was seen by a lot who were well read and were, were well aware of it that it is a friendly family oriented country and hospitable and has very good education system so a lot of the families were aiming to come to Australia. The second option would have been Canada, the UK and some other countries, but Australia was number one priority for quite money. And you got in. And, and we got in luckily. Luckily. And because I, I read that um, your mum had applied and got knocked back and then you ended up doing the application and you were successful in that. Yes, my mum would have applied for uh, several times, I think twice, and got rejected. So the third attempt was, in fact, I still have a copy of the visa application today. <laughs> And uh, I took the application, went through it, and I was quite articulate, and we were able to get a file application within three weeks of, or two and a half weeks of putting it in. And then the January of 2003, we launched in December, the January 2003, we were called for the interview. Now that was when we got the file number. And then uh, in April of 2003, we went for the interview, and then there was a delay, and then got the visa, and we were able to come in April. 
Take me back to the day you landed in Australia. How did you feel? Were you excited, nervous, scared? What feelings ran, ran through you? I think the excitement was really thrilling. There is a, a, some sorts of uh, welcome uh, ceremony that normally a lot of the prior arrival from our community do is that you, uh, when you are landing at the Melbourne airport, they normally would queue at terminal, uh, the international terminal, arrival terminal. I think it is terminal three if I'm not wrong. And there is a big waiting foyer where normally people would go and queue and wait. So being able to arrive on that very first day and uh, getting a lot of, reuniting with a lot of family, I mean family members and potential a lot of relatives and community members who were overseas welcoming us and then having a drive to Dandenong that was where we were settled. You know, it was night time and it was really, you know, very good. You could see obviously the place, you know, look like a promised land as we used to call it. And, you know, obviously, you know, it was quite an exciting moment. And I remember obviously some of the feelings I personally had was that, you know, I'm here to, you know, give my life a start. And, you know, it is either I make it and do it right or probably maybe just don't do it. Uh, so it was a, a feeling of joy to be able to, you know, arrive in a country with a lot of peace and stability and having a start without having to worry, obviously, whether, you know, where will you live next? We are living in Kenya as refugees. We had no status and a lot of the time there is a lot of harassment from the police, you know, commuting in public buses, harassing you, corruption, taking your money and, you know, all of that was gone because you knew, obviously, you are in a world with you know, rule of law, accountabilities, and no police officer or anyone else would, would arrest you and take your money. Looking back, at what point did you realise you wanted to become a lawyer and what actually inspired you to go ahead and practice and study law? Two things. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my inspiration is uh, around the rule of law. So in Africa or South Sudan particularly, it is about the rule of men and women, maybe where people and very powerful individuals take laws into their own hand and they are above the laws and sometimes they manipulate all sorts of justice uh, to suit themselves. They don't like dissenting voices and often they will silence them either by locking them up or killing them. And often, obviously, you know, when you hear a lot of people talking about law and, you know, people saying there is no justice, there is no laws, if this country had laws, this would be this. So again, a lot of a lot of inspiration from that, that, you know, obviously I would want to be a part of a generation that advocate or be part of a process that change a lot of that rule of man to the rule of law. The other inspiration was during my interview uh, by one of the immigration lawyers. His name was Ross. I remember it very well. And he was an immigration lawyer from Melbourne. That is what he told us at the interview. So he was a very passionate man and uh, he was really very genuine and wanted us, to, you know, wanted to understand our story. The interview, you know, he came across very compelling and very compassionate in the sense that he wanted to do everything right to make sure that he processed the visa based on the criteria and merit and trying as best as he can. I remember talking to him about law and his job as a migration lawyer and what it means to him and what it means generally to be a lawyer and. You know, he said he was from Melbourne. I remember his last name was only, I mean, his first name was Rose. I don't remember his last name. So I had a bit of inspiration from him. And obviously, that is where my, my those are the two, my, two sources of my inspiration to get into law. So tell us a little bit more about your legal career and how it's led you to, to working at and being a personal injury lawyer at Slater and Gordon. Uh, my legal career, I would say, began uh, in August of 2004 when I was enrolled at Victoria University Foundation Studies. It is a course I arrived and four months later on I was enrolled in Victoria University Foundation Studies. It is uh, a course that is aimed pretty much to help a lot of people who either wanted to get into engineering or science degrees but have not made it. So upon arrival a lot of my colleagues were already enrolled and second is I arrived at a time when BTEC application had closed in March. So I wanted to make sure that I get in and not get into uh, working in factories, which was the norm at the time among many of my colleagues, and uh, get dragged away by pursuit of money. And I went into Victoria University Foundation Studies, and then by December, I gained an entry into law and science degree. It was a double degree. I was still undecided whether I should pursue law or medicine. 
But by 2006, I went into a straight law degree, and 2009, I became, uh, well, I graduated. And during my time at the university, I had a lot to do. I obviously had a lot of part-time or full-time jobs to do, so I used to work at Cole Supermarket in Richmond, stacking the aisles from midnight to 8 a.m. and having lectures at 9, so one hour window. And I also did a bit of interpreting. I also work as a liaison officer and volunteered as, as well at the community legal centers. So one of the things that helped me, you know, gaining a lot of understanding in the law is volunteering at Pittsburgh Legal Service. And eventually went to work for Bureau Police as a liaison officer. And when I was working as a liaison officer, I was quite keen. So Slate and Gordon had what we call we speak your language launch. It was in July of 2010. I attended that event and met a number of uh, personal injury lawyers and a lot of lawyers who work at Slade and Gordon in different departments. Andrew Gregg as well was at that launch that particular day. And I also met uh, one of the guys who work in the HR department. And I strike conversation, took his business card, went and wrote to him. And after several emails, two and four, I was persuading him and urging him that he should take me as seasonal clerk that I was keen to do uh, four weeks or whatever period on an unpaid voluntary basis to gain the experience. So eventually got me a slot uh, at, at Sunshine and I was able to go in thinking that it would be a four week of non-paid. So I took annual leave from Bikrayo Police where I was working to go and work for free. Turned out that it was a paid employment, $17 an hour, which was quite a good wage during annual leave. So I was very passionate within the first week I was offered a full-time employment, so I was beside myself and very excited, and I've remained there ever since. Uh, I started in the TSE department for six months, and then went into work cover, and more mostly it, it is rigorous, mentally challenging, a lot of litigation, and and then I have been practicing there for nearly seven years now. I love your enthusiasm and persistence to getting you. that first role because it's so hard and you just kept persisting, which was awesome. And I think that is a message for a lot of people. In life, you'll find a lot of points where your life or certain opportunities will pause. And I think the key message is that keep trying. You know, whether you are a law student or a law graduate or a lawyer trying to enter into another area of law or finding a new job or anything of that sort, you really don't need to give up. So, and, and I think one of the key things I have learned as a refugee is resilience and, you know, the saying that it could, uh, it, it could be worse. For example, I've seen a lot of people lose their lives, a lot of people died, a lot of people getting injured and, you know, by shrapnels or bombs or all this sort of stuff. And, you know, I'm lucky to come out obviously alive, uh, lucky to come out not injured, lucky to have my life compared to anyone who is not living. So quite often we lose sight of the very fact that live throw a lot of things at you but you don't need to give up you need to be determined you need to be resilient because your lucky break is just around the corner you also hold a number of leadership positions can you tell us a little bit more about these positions and how you use your positions to help others within your community i'm at the moment the chairperson of the south Sudanese community association in in victoria incorporated it is a not-for-profit community association so what i do is uh, i have uh, 17 other people plus myself 18. We were 19 but one resigned and uh, part of our job is providing leadership and we also act as advocacy group uh, at you know advocating on a number of service gaps and systemic issues affecting young people, parents, families and a lot of newly arrived migrants from South Sudan's background. Uh, there are a lot of uh, legal issues that normally arise and I sometimes refer to myself as Law Institute of Victoria equivalent of a receptionist. So I get a lot of the queries and directing the traffic, be it criminal law, to some of my colleagues like Andrew Papa. And wherever there is a need, uh, there is also a requirement for us to provide leadership in terms of providing uh, support letters uh, for a number of issues before the court to provide mitigating circumstances as to how we know people and uh, their offending. Uh, also regarding visa cancellation or spouse visa and providing submissions for either some artists to come uh, that visas have been cancelled. A lot of artists from South Sudan obviously struggle to come here and provide entertainment for the community. 
simply because of the perception that they would come and refuse and the entertainment business are quite a challenge. So it is a broad work that we do. Uh, I also sit on a number of youth committees or, or board as a board member or a committee member and part of that is uh, working on a number of youth initiatives uh, to provide uh, empowerment uh, or activities that empower young people. Uh, we have also community-led activities uh, that are initiated to provide uh, empowerment activities and some of those are either providing cultural activities like cultural dances, uh, shows that empower young people or bridging intergenerational gap between you know the families and young people. We also hold seminars uh, to provide education on a number of issues. I remember uh, we recently had a scam where a lot of the community members were scammed you know over 200 but about 100 and something reported the police uh, by in excess of 1.5 million dollars but for those who have reported them, the police it is un over 1 million dollars by a lady who was hold holding herself out as a broker taking deposit scamming them and we pursued that she was eventually charged and you know is now obviously having an ongoing case before the court so we we eventually conducted a lot of uh, liter literacy classes and workshops to a lot of uh, parents and families to be able to be aware a lot of these sorts of scammers out in the public. So we also have you know patrolling which we do uh, and that is around major events like Mumba Wide Night where we come out and do an outreach activities with young people to ensure that you know we tell them off wherever you know they are not behaving and causing a nuisance to the public. So we do quite a, a number of activities. There are obviously soccer activities that we do and run. Uh, I also uh, work closely with Western Tigers, so they have been close to me, and you know I've been working with them, still socially playing, you know, on weekends, for example, you know, some weekends if we have a bio from soccer, I train with them, and we have been running that for, uh, I think I got it running. It was running by 2004 when I arrived, so it started in 2002 by a gentleman called Michael. Uh, and ever since, it has no, never died. So we're playing socially in Maidstone and Braybrook. So I also sit on uh, a committee with Multicultural Hub, which is in Sunshine, uh, within the city of Bringbang. And it is a soccer hub providing a number of soccer activities to a number of groups and newly arriving asylum seekers within the city of Bringbang. So the role of what I do and sit on on a pro bono basis is quite large and it ranges from soccer, workshops, parenting lessons, <coughs> classes, homework program, legal referrals, legal <laughs> advice and all of that. That's incredible. What motivated you to, to become a leader and be on these, these committees? I think what motivated me is the number of issues that are there. You really underestimate sometimes, for example, that there are people who are struggling and uh, for someone like me who live in the community and uh, happen to be privileged to have uh, legal background and knowledge, you see people struggling every day to navigate the system, people are struggling. For example, when somebody has had their you know, visa cancelled, for example, especially the young people, first of all, they know nothing and uh, they are on the verge of uh, being deported or obviously are in detention already from prison if they had been, uh, say for example, logged up for more than 12 months, it is an automatic visa cancellation. They know nobody, no mig don't know any migration agent, don't know how to put in the appeal within 28 days. So, and a number of other issues as well where a lot of other people who don't do the right thing every day for ordinary struggling people take advantage of them. So I thought that you know, providing a leadership or being part of that process to help providing the light and walking along with people where they have some challenges was the key thing. And I think that was where my greatest motivation arose. Normally, I'm the sort of person that want to get my hands dirty and, and work rather than you know, complaining or saying people are being done this and that. You'd rather be, you are better off being part of the solution as opposed to sitting and not, not doing anything or complaining. Because you can take action. Yes. There are people within the legal profession that will say that they, they're not where they want to be with their career because of their background. What would you say 
like from your experience, what would you say to help them push through that, that issue? I will tell them what I told one of my colleagues in a class. Uh, it was a biomedical science class and I remember she was telling me that, you know, you're wasting your time doing double degree uh, of law and science and that, you know, the mother did law and the mother obviously has not reached far and she was an African uh, young girl and you know she talked me out of it and she was saying all these sort of negative things and I said your mom's experience may be different from my experience and what I would tell those young people is obviously imagine someone like myself you know who has been a refugee for 18 years of his life uh, and somebody like myself who has never had formal early childhood education. Obviously, I went to school when I would have been seven. That was when I started learning the alphabet, writing on a sandy soil, you know, with my finger, A, B, C, D, and doing the cramming. Imagine someone like myself who doesn't have any connections, don't have any family, came here in 2004, going through uh, university, getting a degree, and being able to, you know, get an entry into law and being able to practice. I can say probably maybe what Barack Obama normally say during his first campaign that yes you can or yes we can. So they can do it. All they need is, you know, persistence. You know, sometimes, you know, there's a saying that when you have negative attitude towards anything, what you get is negative. But if you are positive and remain positive, you know, it may not be the first opportunity that will arise. You could get knocked back ten times, hundred times but keep pushing. The other advice is sometimes, you know, if you're a law graduate and it is becoming difficult to gain, uh, get entry into first year or graduate entry, there are other alternative pathways. Entry level roles, for example, could be government junior roles, which are probably maybe under wage. All you need is an experience. So, and once you get the experience, the money will come later on. So you could get into those entry roles and start as junior as you are and then make entry pathways. And I remember telling one of our guy from our community some time back that, you know, I persuaded him, encouraged him to go to school and he started with diploma of IT. You know, a few years ago he had masters in IT. And we normally have this conversation and he says, you know, it was amazing that he told me this sort of advice and, you know, always being there to push me and advising me to remain there. The other thing is, you know, getting your resume and going door knocking. You know, there are many single and sole practitioners that would need a hand. So if you go in and, you know, providing, you know, some support and, you know, volunteering that you want to help, they will take you on board. There are legal community centers that are there. You need to build your experience to be above, you know, other people or being a competitive. So without doing that, Law at the moment is quite competitive and I think a lot of people are getting disheartened simply because when you are a law student, there are many other law students, there are many universities pumping out a lot of law graduates. But to be above uh, the top competitive people, you need to be a well-rounded person in a number of areas and building yourself. So I can tell them, don't give up, be persistent and determined. As you have. Thank you, yes. Future dreams and plans, what are they? I was asked this question some time back when I was doing SBS interview and I said I would hope to be uh, UN General Secretary, but if Kevin Rudd couldn't get it, <laughs> could I? I think it is a challenge <laughs> that obviously, you know, if I beat it one day to be one, it will be a, a great enthusiasm and determination. Other than that, obviously, I would hope to remain in law uh, as uh, a solicitor, possibly later on as a barrister and also I have an interest in academia. I may start by tutoring or lecturing and you know it'll be great to you know 20, 30 years to have Dr. Mono as a professor at the university as well and helping a lot of you know law students, law graduates and all of that you know in, in the legal profession so those are my dreams. Before we wrap up how do you motivate yourself every day? Very good question. I get asked this question a lot of the time and I normally say probably maybe, you know, I have too much energy and adrenaline that if I don't find something to do, I'll probably maybe be bored to death. I, how do I motivate myself? You know, I wake up positively with a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm that, you know, this is another day. I just need to drive myself 
And I think over time you just get used to it because you become workaholic and often it becomes a passion, it becomes a routine, it becomes a part of what you have got to do. I think uh, the difficulty is getting yourself into that sort of a routine. But once you get in, in fact you'll find it that on days when you have nothing to do, time flies so quickly that when you reflect back you feel you have wasted and you are worth nothing because you haven't done anything for that day. So I motivate myself by trying out to get out, help some people. You know, a lot of satisfaction I get is when I hear people, you know, appreciating or being able to say thank you or you made a difference to my life. I think those are very, very encouraging and gratifying when somebody say, you know, I couldn't have done this without your help or you have really made a difference today or you have contributed to my life or you have solved a burden that had been burdening me for quite some time. Those are some of the encouragement I get and you know I've gotten used to it to be motivated every day to do them. Cot, thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey. Thank you Louisa, thank you for inviting me. Now Cot and I would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight you're taking away from today's conversation? Comment and share below and let us know. If you like this episode please subscribe to our channels and share this video with your friends and thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time on Gatehouse Insights.